As for me, Allah has freed me. As for you, like the donkey carries loads of books over its back and knowing not what it is. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu salam ala rasulillah, amma ba'd assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and welcome back to Beyond the Mimbar podcast. I'm your host Muhammad Ba Saeed and today, inshallah ta'ala, I've got a very, very, very special episode and a very, very, very special guest. I'm joined with none other than Sheikh Muhammad Al-Maliki. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Hayyakum Allah akhi Muhammad. I welcome and also all the listeners and uh, all the brothers around the world. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah fiqh. It's um, the first time I've got you here for the podcast. Is this your first podcast? No. MashaAllah. So you're professional. Yeah, we've been uh, many, <laughs> especially in Africa. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Jayid. Alhamdulillah. So today the topic that me and you will be discussing, inshallah ta'ala, is um, uh, seeking knowledge, inshallah, and da'wah. And the angle that I want to talk talk about seeking knowledge is more to do with your life inshallah ta'ala. so using your life as a, an example and a lesson maybe for people who are listening in at home yeah, so sure. the first question i want to ask sheikh inshallah ta'ala is um tell me about where you grew up and how your childhood was like alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi amma ba'd first of all my name is muhammad Ibn Abdullah al-Maliki. Uh, I'm from a tribe called Bani Malik in the south part of Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, originally, they used to be known as Bajila. From them is Jarir ibn Abdullah al-Bajri, the well-known Sahabi. And uh, my father left the, uh, the village to live in the city of Jeddah in the very early um, 50s. And I was born there in Jeddah in 1963 uh, in a simple area called Bab Sharif, which is well known to all those who come for Hajj and Umrah because it is the wholesale market there. And I grew up there, alhamdulillah, in our childhood uh, before the age of uh, schooling, they used to take us to something called Al-Kuttab. And Al-Kuttab is either in a masjid, and that's usually for boys, or a house of a female teacher, and that is for girls. And I used to go to a Kuttab called uh, the Kuttab of uh, Al-Izzi Rajab, a sheikh from Yemen, who used to teach us the Quran the Arabic and the issues of fiqh and tawheed. Uh, up until, alhamdulillah, we uh, grew up a little bit, then we entered the school, and the schools in Saudi Arabia, as yani, everybody knows, the curriculum there, from the first year, you study tawheed, you study fiqh, you study Quran, alhamdulillah. Uh, and in the... Uh, Midst of the interme- uh, elementary uh, schooling, uh, that was like when I was about 10, I joined another uh, kuttab, but this time it's not called kuttab, it's called tahfid, more than a kuttab, because it's uh, focusing on Quran, mm-hmm. memorizing the Quran with the tajweed. And, uh, in another masjid, another sheikh from Yemen called Sheikh Abu Abdul Rahman. And uh, <coughs> When uh, I was in my uh, teenaging, like uh, 13, something like that, I met uh, the first sheikh in my life. That was Sheikh Mahjoub from Sudan, who was uh, teaching in Masjid bin Mahfud in our area, Bab Sharif. It's a well-known masjid, very big masjid. And not far from that time, maybe two years, I met my first uh, most beloved Sheikh, Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab Al Banna, Rahimahullah, uh, was a teacher in the uh, Institute of Al Medina, Jamia Al Islamia, the Islamic University in Medina. And he used to live in Jeddah, he has family in Jeddah. And whenever uh, he comes, like in the holidays, especially the summer holidays were so long that time. 
and he used to uh, go around the masajid and teach uh, Tawheed mainly. And Alhamdulillah, him and uh, Sheikh Mahmoud Mahdi al-Istanbuli, uh, the author of a book called Tuhfatul Mawlud, he was one of uh, like the senior students of Sheikh Albani. Uh, he's from Syria. And uh, Alhamdulillah, from there, we started uh, having contacts with the ulama, but we remained a while until we were uh, self-dependent so we can travel a little bit mm. far than our district to get to seek knowledge. And that was, alhamdulillah, when I started seeking knowledge with Sheikh uh, Muhammad, Muhammad al-Mukhtar al-Shinqiti in Masjid al-Malik Saud in Medina Road. It was uh, a bit uh, far, but at that time we are already in age to drive and like that. Mashallah, yeah. Allahumma barik. Mashallah, an amazing uh, uh, childhood. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Sheikh, I, I know there's going to be viewers watching and they're thinking, Mashallah, yani, you're speaking to me now with the podcast in the English language. Mashallah, where did you learn to speak uh, English? Well, this has, uh, again, a story, but I would like first, be, I will come back to this. I no would like problem. to emphasize no problem. about uh, something very, very important. And that is the uh, best thing for all the youth to focus on learning the deen in early age because that is the time when they can memorize it and it can stick in their memory forever. Uh, but do not uh, busy yourself with other stuffs and delaying learning the, uh, the deen because the latest you learn, the difficult to uh, understand and memorize. Back to the point of English, um, maybe the people will find it yani, funny, but it's the truth. I was uh, the worst student in the intermediate school because at that time, English used to be uh, taught when uh, the student is inter intermediate, like after six years of elementary, you go to three years intermediate, then three years high school, then the, to the university. When I came to the intermediate school, I never had any word of English, maybe yes, no, as all young know, people. Um, and uh, for three years, I was a bad boy in, in that subject, English. And I, uh, I fail in the final exam, I fail. They made me to uh, make it again, but I have a feeling until today that I did not pass it. And they gave me the lowest uh, score just to let me leave the school. <laughs> and uh, then, uh, I, when I was in the high school and I started getting deep into seeking knowledge and I came to know Sheikh Uthaymeen and Sheikh Luhaydan, uh, uh, Sheikh Fouzan, Sheikh Ali bin Ghusun, this Mashaikh, I hear uh, once that Sheikh Uthaymeen said, if I uh, were to yani, uh, knew the future, I would have learned English because that will allow me to teach much more wider. Because the Sheikh had many students from the West. So I said, why don't I take the opportunity and do it now? Maybe because the, the Sheikh is saying, if I knew future, that means now he can't. Because his age and he's busy. So I started uh, self-education and then I joined uh, some institutes for some any courses, not that uh, yani really beneficial, but it was helping. Mm -hmm. But what what really uh, helped me in learning English was my zeal to learn it. And uh, I started reading, uh, listening, and I was an imam of a masjid one day, uh, which was near opposite of the uh, English school that is an international school. In there, brothers from America, Canada, and England, 
used to teach. And they did not used to have Arabic. So they used to attend my khutbah and they asked for the rules. So I learned from them English and they learned from them, from me Arabic and uh, Deen. MashaAllah. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Allah barik fi. But yani, I'm sorry to disturb you. No, no, no. Yani, no it's okay. I always like to put some yani, kind of, uh, not jokes, but it's funny uh, facts. Uh, I remember when I started teaching in the um, uh, minority Dawa Center in Jeddah, uh, I came to teach. Uh, you know, people who are adults and, you know, workers and from all different parts of the world. And I started teaching them and I see them sometimes laugh. I used to be surprised. Why? First of all, we in the, uh, and so in, in, in Arab countries generally, we have problem with some letters in English, like letter P. And to me, that time, there was only one B. <laughs> one B. All people. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, bakery. All the same. So I started teaching, and he used some words, as I, as they say, uh, transliterated, which is, yani, to me now, in, in my age, I see a lot of mistakes of many uh, translators in in the talks and translators of books, because they go and uh, try to find a word fits every word in Arabic, and that cannot work. Sometimes you have to describe to explain. So, for example, I came to the class and I was teaching them hadith. إِذَا أَحَبَّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَخَاهُ فَلْيُخْبِرْهُ. And I said, يعني, uh, if one of you loves his brother. He must inform him. He must go and say to him, I love you. So they all were, uh, yeah, they all put their hands on their faces like that. Said, <laughs> What's wrong with you guys? One of them came to me. Uh, his name is Jabir from Philippines, mashallah. Uh, he, he said, Ya Sheikh, you cannot use this because when man, uh, uh, yani, like um, likes a man, he should say, uh, I like you, not I love you. That only between male and female. So I said, subhanAllah. In Arabic, no, we say the same word. And that made me to uh, buy a special dictionary for Islamic words. And I started reviewing before going to the classes because I noticed that there are different differences between the two languages mm. and the usage of it. Yeah. No? So that's why I advise the, the, the brothers, English is uh, yani a language. You need to, first of all, know what for you are using it. As the English of the engineer and the medicine doctor, is not the same, and the English of the Imam or Da'i is not the same. Yes, they, they, they use uh, the mechanism, but the wordings and the phrases and it must be different. Mm. Uh, I've never thought about it like that, you know. SubhanAllah. Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah. Coming back to um, the, your, your studies, um, what or, or who maybe inspired you to start you know, seeking knowledge? You know, a person maybe or an incident, a time that made me feel, feel like I, I really want to study the deen now. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> as I told you, alhamdulillah, we grew, grew up amongst shiukh and we were, and that was very common in our uh, yani childhood. Um, and I can't say Sheikh Muhammad al-Banna was the first, but not the very, yani, the one who took us deep. But subhanallah, uh, I done hajj when I was very young, very, very young. And that time, Mina used to be in tents, not like it now. People come and build up their tents. Mm -hmm. I then had with a group. Um, they hired a building 
not a tent, not tents, but a building. They rented a building in Mina next to uh, the camp number one of the Islamic affairs. It's called like this, camp number one, because the camps were in numbers. Camp number one of the Islamic affairs was the camp of Sheikh ibn Uthaymeen. And that camp is for uh, teachings and giving fatawa. And it's like a mosque, a musalla, prayer area. Subhanallah, I didn't know, I didn't realize, but the first day we arrived to Mina, we found that the AC in our room is broken. It's not working. And it is hot in the summer. So uh, I was told that the camp next to us, they have big central ACs. So I decided to go and sit there most of the time. When I went there, I found a sheikh. I, did, I never recognized him, first time I see him. And maybe most of the audience don't know him if I say his name. Uh, but his speech was very beautiful, especially about Tawheed. Then I asked, who's this sheikh? He said, this is Sheikh Ali ibn Ghusun. He passed away, rahimahullah, from Riyadh. And subhanAllah, I loved it. So I remained seated. And I started seeing Sheikh Uthameen coming quietly. I never knew him in, in person. Yeah, we knew him by fatawa, but never met him, except that day. And he was the head of the of that camp. And mashallah, yani, so many shiukh there. That is the ignition of the inspiration of seeking knowledge. SubhanAllah. And yani from then I really, because I saw many students of knowledge from all different nationalities, all different lands, they are always in the camp of Sheikh Uthaymeen. So I said, no, I will, I will inshallah do. But you know, because in Jeddah, we did not have major scholars. I started looking after, for uh, shiukh, found Sheikh Muhammad al-Mukhtar, and then I heard about uh, Sheikh Muhammad Adam al-Ethiopi. But before that, uh, we used to have hosts, uh, guests, guest speakers. We had uh, Sheikh Albani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala one time. Uh, and we had uh, we had a weekly class in Aqid al Wasatiya and Usul al Thalatha by our noble and humble Sheikh Muhammad Aman al Jami Rahimahullah. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we finished the two books on him in Jeddah or with him in Jeddah. And then I joined his classes in the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu in Medina. But when I heard of uh, Sheikh Muhammad Adam, I said, let me go. He's in Mecca. He's not that far. So I started going, traveling uh, to Mecca six days a week. Six days a week, I started going for about uh, 17 years. And I really uh, was fully inspired by the uh, way the Sheikh teaches because I used to read the biographies of the Salaf like Sira Alam and Nubala. And I, when I saw the Sheikh, I said, it's, his way is totally different than any other Sheikh. He is telling the, the, the narrators, he's uh, um, um, explaining the hadith. So I, I liked it. And it made the difference in my life, really, especially in seeking knowledge. And what made it to be much more uh, yani, is, as an as inspiration is that I made, I done Hajj with the Sheikh a couple of times. I traveled with the Sheikh to Riyadh, to Taif, to see the, the Mufti, and traveled with him to see Sheikh Muqbir, rahimahullah, in Jeddah when he was uh, uh, having treatment there. This made me to come closer to the Sheikh and know him much more, uh, better than before. And that made me to love seeking knowledge. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. Um, you know, amazing, you know, from the from the incident about the air conditioning being broken yes, and yes, what and what it brought you to. Subhanallah. You know, absolutely amazing, subhanAllah. And uh, Shaykh, you know, of course, with any path, you know, any journey that you take, it's not always easy. No, you know, isn't. and there is some things that you, uh, there's some difficulties along, along the way. 
So for yourself, what kind of challenge maybe you faced during this time and how did you overcome that's it? Good. Yeah. That's good. You know, when I knew Sheikh Muhammad Adam, rahimahullah, it was when I just married and I was very young. And I was working at that time in Jeddah airport as AC mechanic. This work in Saudi Arabia is very, very hard because the weather there is hot. And as AC mechanic, you are either working with window box ACs that you have to carry, pull out and carry, which is heavy, or you're working with central ACs on top roofs where the heat is so extreme. And we used to work six days a week, eight hours a day, from eight to four. And four o'clock, I go back home very exhausted, find my wife, cooking food, eat, take shower, and drive to Mecca. Six days a week, imagine. And the real uh, yani challenge is that the six ways, the six days I go to Mecca are different from the six days I work, meaning my family have no any uh, day with me, a full day, because at work, I'm on Fridays off. The Sheikh on Thursday off. So I, I, ha I have to yani, be in both. And mashallah, the family helped me a lot. Um, another thing, uh, Sheikh Abdulaziz bin Baz, rahimahullah, used to come to Mecca. And it was a bit easy for us, but it is harder than the time of Sheikh Adam, mm -hmm. because Sheikh Ibn Baz's classes was after Fajr. Huh. And Sheikh Adam was after Maghrib and after Isha. So I had to travel twice a day. And I go before Fajr like an hour, attend the class with Sheikh Abdul Ibn Baz, then go back to work in Jeddah, then go back to Sheikh Adam and like that. But what makes it even more difficult is that Sheikh Ibn Baz uh, used to spent some time in Mecca, but most of the summer season in Taif. Mm -hmm. So I had to drive, but it was very difficult because two hours uh, journey going, coming. Two hours going, two hours coming. And I was working. So I rented uh, an apartment in, in Taif for one full year, and I took my family there. So Fajr, I attend with the Sheikh, then I go to Jeddah alone, do my work, Asr, I go to Mecca, attend the classes, then I go Taif to my family. But as difficult as people now find it, as uh, beautiful and sweet, I found it. And I wish that it remained until today. SubhanAllah. But the Mashaikh has passed away, Rahimahullah. Allah Akbar. You know, um, if you come comparing, you know, uh, to to today, where a lot of things are accessible, you know, maybe you can attend Drus online, especially with when we had COVID and everything. You know, for ourselves, the winter conference was all online. You know, and and this this is uh, something very different. It is different. It is totally different. When you first of all, the ilm generally is to be taken in person. Uh, the ilm is not to be taken via anything, unless if it is the only way you can do it. But if you can go, you do your best to go. Yani when you hear, for example, from the Salaf, how did they tour around the world, yani Imam uh, Abu Hatim al-Razi and Imam Abu Zur al-Razi decided to come from Ari, which is now in Afghanistan. Uh, and they, they wanted to go to Egypt to listen, for, uh, hear the hadith from the ulama of Egypt. But they did not have the means, so they walked them. And there was one, not a alim, but he is someone who loved uh, the people of ilm. He came with them. On the way, before, uh, uh, opposite of Alexandria, they collapsed, three of them. A, sh a, a ship came and the captain was navigating uh, because they wanted to park. So uh, he was, uh, they wanted to dig somewhere. So he was navigating and 
he saw three bodies laying down. He sent someone with uh, water and some biscuits. And when they, when those people came, they found that the old man who is not a alim already died because of hunger and uh, because they are very tired. And those two, they were barely uh, breathing, hardly, hardly breathing. So they feed them and then they talk them to the captain. The captain was a friend of the ruler of Alexandria at that time. And they told him that they are ulama and they come to seek knowledge. And he wrote them a letter to the Amir there uh, of Alexandria. And he, the Amir, hosted them. But look at that. He walked. Imam Ahmad came to Hajj uh, just to meet the ulama. He did not have enough money to get into the caravan as a, as a pilgrim. Mm -hmm. So he asked the caravan, can you take me and I be the one load and offload your stuff every time you stop. When he reached Mecca, he met many ulama. And uh, right after Hajj, he wanted to meet uh, Abdul Razak Sanani. But they told him Abdul Razak has left to Yemen. So he does not have a tr tr mean of transport, neither that he has money. So he walked from Mecca to Sana'a. From Mecca to Sana'a, nearly uh, seven, 800 kilometers. And when he reached uh, Sana'a, he uh, found, he asked where is Abdul Razak. They showed him his door, house door. And Abdul Razak was just entering after Salat al-Isha. When Imam Ahmad called him, Abdul Razak turned, no, he doesn't know who this man is. And then Imam Ahmad introduced himself to him, and they both wanted to get the opportunity of seeking more knowledge. So they stood talking, forgetting to sit, to enter until, the, until Fajr. Look at that. When you hear like these stories, I myself, when I hear this, I say I'm a spoiled <laughs> student of knowledge. I go Mecca by by car, air conditioned car. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. They went walking. Allah you know? Yeah, it is true, Sheikh, and it's uh, it should really humble you, you know, and make you full of humility when you hear these stories. And and, and it, on top of it, to respect the knowledge, you know, respect the knowledge and respect the mashayikh, respect the scholars that came before you. And it's a it's a big deal, and unfortunately, something maybe we're lacking. Allah um, Musta'an. My my next question, inshallah, is um, you mentioned a lot of people that that, that you studied under, and uh, the the list, alhamdulillah, is, is long. Is if, is there one sheikh that you would say that out of all of them, this is like my my sheikh? He's he's really influenced me a lot. Well, alhamdulillah, yani I studied under uh, many, as you said, but I'm uh, I'm known as a student of Sheikh Muhammad Adam. And that is something really uh, uh, yani make me feel happy and because uh, studying under Sheikh Adam is not something really little. Very rare to see like Sheikh Adam today, the way he is teaching. And uh, yes, he is the one really who made the uh, change and difference in my life, especially in seeking knowledge. And even in the in the uh, normal life, the Sheikh was someone who is very Zahid. He's not that one who's uh, after dunya, he doesn't know anything, he doesn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yes, Sheikh Muhammad Adam. SubhanAllah. Yeah. And what, um, in your life of seeking knowledge, what lesson really, till today, has stuck with you? Till now, you've you've never forgotten this lesson, and you've took it with you everywhere you've gone. Listen as a listen with the sheikh in a class, or uh, or a, uh, yani, maybe like a principle, a or, principle. Or, or or something that you learned that you've always carried with you, and you made an effort to always make sure that you did it. Okay. Um, the I will tell you the the the, the uh, incident which made this lesson, but I want to, uh, yani. Uh, spot the lesson itself. Do not go to any uh, circle of knowledge unless you're prepared. What I mean by prepared, if you know the, 
the book or the topic or the subject, uh, read as much as you can uh, uh, of the examination books of it. So just to collect information uh, about it. And when you go, uh, you pay attention, focus with the sheikh. Do not accompany any of these books that you read with you because it's going to uh, take you away from focusing. And uh, be ready, expecting that the sheikh asks you. Why I say that? Uh, in the very uh, early days, I started studying with Sheikh Adam. First of all, the sheikh used to, as I said, teach six days a week, two uh, classes a day. And uh, four days, uh, like for example, uh, after Maghrib, uh, one of uh, Bukhari and uh, Bukhari Saturday and Sunday Bukhari, Monday and Tuesday Muslim. But after Isha, every day one book of the Sunan, Sunan of Dawood Sunan. And in the other days, he used to teach, for example, uh, Al Fiya, Al Fiya Ibn Malik, and Al Fiya Al Siyuti. So Al Fiya Ibn Malik in the Arabic language and Al Fiya Al Siyuti in the uh, Hadith. Mustalah al-Hadith. And he did not used to begin. And he, the Sheikh, had a book called Talkhis Rijal al-Sahihain. Qurrat al-Ain fi Talkhis Rijal al-Sahihain. And he did not used to start teaching until, because the number of students that time were was small, so the Sheikh used to ask every one of us to say from memory five narrators, the biography of them, and uh, in the days of, for example, al fiyat ibn Malik, five uh, lines of the poem, and on the al fiyat uh, Siyuti, the same. So this made us to memorize. But in one day, and uh, the sheikh was uh, explaining uh, the book, and he wanted to uh, take as a proof to what he said from al ibn Malik. It was a linguistic matter. Okay. And the Sheikh, subhanAllah, the Sheikh is memorizing like computer. He's memorizing all these books like that. So, but we are human. Sometimes you you find yourself, you know, yeah. forgot something. No. So the Sheikh said, who, uh, who, 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 who remember, who remember, who remember? But because we all were busy either with books that we read and we accompanied with us and, you know, we were busy. The question was shock, shocking. Mm -hmm. We could not remember because it's out of sudden. Then the Sheikh remembered himself. And he said what he wanted to say. Then he said, Amma, I will say it in Arabic, then translate it. Amma ana fabarra'anillah. Wa amma antum fakal himari yahmilu asfara. As for me, Allah has freed me. As for you, like the donkey carries loads of books over its back and knowing not what it is. That was a great lesson to me that I never forget. This was, I don't know, maybe uh, more than 25 years ago, but still, I, like if I can see today happening. Why? Because this gave me the principle of seeking knowledge properly. You prepare, come to the lesson without any of those books you've read. You come to receive, not to deliver. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. That is the lesson and I, I, I gained from the Dars of Sheikh Adam and that is the lesson I always, always say to my students wherever I go. MashaAllah. Allahu Akbar. Amazing. And Sheikh, um, Oh, we've so far we've talked about the seeking of the knowledge. Now I want to go on to speak about the da'wah acts aspect of it. Mm. <clears throat> Where, when did you first enter, let's say, the field of da'wah and started giving da'wah uh, together with uh, after you reached a level of seeking knowledge? Well, uh, the start of uh, giving da'wah was a very early age, but the this uh, this thing. Gang gradually, as seeking knowledge gang gradually, this also gang gradually. 
when we were in uh, the tahfid, not the kutab, after the kutab, the tahfid, when we were like in uh, 12, 13, 14, uh, we used to lead the prayer in, in our masajid. They were a small, small masajid at that time. And uh, our shiuch used to encourage us to uh, teach the people because the people that time were illiterate and lemon, even old people. Mm -hmm. So they uh, suggested to us to teach from Riyadh Salihin. Just read. We consider it teaching, but it is reading. We read it for them. So that was the, the, the beginning. In the beginning, it was a bit difficult because first time you face people, elder, uh, elderly people, some of them maybe your father, your uncle. And it was hesitating, you know. But uh, by the time, alhamdulillah, uh, and the, the uh, magnificent change in the field of da'wah regarding me, was when I uh, started working in King Abdulaziz Airport. At that time, uh, uh, there were uh, thousands of uh, uh, of workers from Bangladesh, and Bangladesh was very closed country before they take their independent independency, mm -hmm. uh, and they came direct to Saudi. And there are a lot of uh, you know. Uh, innovations and ignorance about the real religion, especially Tawheed. So I found it a good opportunity and I started giving uh, some durus to the workers, like in Arabic language, teaching them Arabic language, uh, the Qaida Baghdadiya, not Nuraniya, the Qaida Baghdadiya of how to pro pronounce the alphabet A, E, U, Ba, B, Bu. And Alhamdulillah, it was very. Uh, yani, uh, encourageable to me, not to them. To them either, but to me much was much more to, to, to teach. And Alhamdulillah, I started giving some other drus like Tawheed and Fiqh. And uh, from there, Alhamdulillah, one of the workers was Filipino who embraced Islam in the Dawah Center. Then he spoke to the uh, authority in the Dawah Center about me. So they came to me. They said, we want you to come because Ahmed Berdilla, that's his name. Mm -hmm. Ahmed Berdilla has told us a lot about you. You are teaching them here and we want this experience there. I said, what experience? I'm, I'm, I'm nothing. They said, no, 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 come, come, come. So I went, I went there and Alhamdulillah, that was, I can't say it's a challenge, but it is positive challenge, really. It encouraged me, Alhamdulillah. And that made me too. But the first, uh, those were Lehman people. Okay. When I started, as I told you, I was the Imam opposite of the international school. The brothers from the West, yes, they did not know Arabic. They did not have much knowledge, but they were uh, some kind of students of knowledge because they, they were uh, eager to learn, right? So there was the challenge, the real challenge. And, and through them, I started my out kingdom uh, da'wah. Yeah, because one of them was from Canada and he insisted that I go to Canada. First land, I landed outside Saudi Arabia for da'wah was Canada. Yeah. Then uh, some brothers from UK. And there were some brothers from America, but uh, I, I didn't go to America. And I still uh, oh, hesitate yeah. to go to America. Okay. Has a story. <laughs> yeah, my mother, rahimahullah, made a condition Ayyum. that I don't, I don't enter two countries. I don't know why. Okay. I know, but the reason gone now. She said America and Sudan. Sudan because that time there were, you know, the problems, and so I gave her the promise that I will not uh, enter these two countries. <laughs> Subhanallah. And um, you, you've, you've traveled a lot of places you know Allahumma barik you know many countries you we were talking uh, last time you were here back in uh, in march that you've been to to africa you know to kenya and places like this so my question is in each country that you visited the muslims are they facing the same issues or does it change from country to country no definitely the issues uh, the, the, the hardships, the difficulties, and the needs, 
and even the quality of uh, receivers there of the dawa is different yeah. it's different to me the best is africa yes they they have a big demand they, they are very poor but yani mashallah yani they love seeking knowledge they love seeking knowledge and they are very serious i give you one example i was in gambia one day in west africa and i was in the capital some brothers came from up north from a place called basai and they said they, they want me to come there and give uh, like a daura conference three days i said okay ask my host they asked the host he agreed we traveled like four or five hours by car i came there after Isha, we found them preparing food for us. We ate, and then we sat chatting. Uh, I asked the brothers, uh, after Fajr, we are going to start the conference, because after Fajr is the conference, after Maghrib, we tour around the masajid of the area, giving some reminder. I said, what book you want us to teach? Because this is, first of all, I don't like to come and give seminars and lectures. I love to teach books. So they said, uh, we want Ha'iyya uh, ibn Abi Dawood. Ha'iyya is a tough book. It's in Aqeedah. It's 34 uh, lines poem. But it's in Aqeedah. I said, yeah, Juan, I thought that these people, they just want new book that others didn't do, so they are known for it. I said, yeah, Juan, fame is not, uh, said, la, wallah, ya, Sheikh. I said, la, la. Usul al is enough. Yeah. Because you guys uh, don't know. I said, La ya Sheikh. I said, when I s found them insisting, I said, okay, I turned a bit angry. I said, okay, with one condition. Yeah. I don't start until one of you uh, yani, recite it all and no any mistake, even in the pronunciations. Yeah. They said, khalas. When they said, khalas, okay, I became very calm. I said, I won now. <laughs> I will do what I want. Mm -hmm. After Fajr, I came, sat on the chair. I said the wording of openings. And then I said, okay, who's going to recite the Ha'iyya? Now I, I thought that they all will not down their heads. They said, yeah, and they named, I forget the name, they named somebody. And they told him to stand up. When he stood up, I was shocked. I was a little child, 11, 11, 11 years old maybe, and he recited it all, like if he is not only an Arab, but from Quraysh. Subhanallah. Very fluent and memorizing it in, 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 in memory. I said to them then, look ya ikhwa. Now, seeing this, I can bravely say that I should be sitting down and you all come sit on the chair. You guys are serious. Your guys are serious. So the, the uh, needs are different from place to place. The uh, hardships in those places are different. You know, I've been to uh, Asia. In Asia, it's difficult for a da'i to, to give any da'wah. Because the people there, you know, they are not not impossible, but difficult. Mm -hmm. Not every masjid will welcome you, you know. Um, and likewise, when you come to the West, in the West is, you know, people are not familiar with sitting for yani, like an hour on ground and going through a book and every day they come. The style of life here is different. So yani, one needs to familiarize himself with what he is going to yani, see. Mm. Uh, Allah so, Allah. Uh, mashallah. Uh, subhanAllah. You know, um, I keep repeating amazing, you know, because it's, uh, 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 you know, it's uh, absolutely, you know, these uh, many gems. Allah Um what I wanna, want to ask now, for if anyone who's watching, the brothers or sisters that are watching, you know, and ha want to, uh, to give da'wah, <clears throat> because we mentioned yourself, um, at what level of seeking knowledge should one be um, 
maybe not to say allowed, but one should be recommended that now you should you should give da'wah, and and of course da'wah is different forms, you know, to the to, to give da'wah to your family is da'wah and to the people and and to have a class, but what level of seeking of knowledge should you have? Until you say, now you can go out and, and speak about Al-Islam. It is good you mentioned that da'wah is different levels. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we all know the ayah as in Surah Fussalat where Allah Ta'ala said, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who he is, the one can be better, than, better in saying than the one who uh, called to Allah uh, do righteous deeds and say I'm from amongst the Muslims. And this means every every Muslim, based on whatever knowledge you have, you share it. You share it. And that's what the Prophet Sallallahu said when he said, Man ra'a minkum munkaran He who ever sees a, a munkar, a, a munkar means something which is... Um, I don't want to say evil, mm -hmm. but not correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, not correct. Mm -hmm. Let him then to change it. Let him then to change it. Type. Now, how are you going to? Uh, who who is this person? The Prophet Sallallahu said, "Minkum amongst you," meaning the whole ummah. Mm -hmm. So everyone has to practice this. Has to exercise this. It is not necessarily to be a alim to do that. But when you uh, when you are not a proper student of knowledge and you want to sit up a class and you know have students and teach books and this and that, that is wrong and dangerous at the same time. Dangerous at the same time. Because you may teach teach something wrong and those people uh, go to different areas and teach that something wrong and later you realize that you were wrong but now accumulation uh, of uh, sins on your record you know what I mean so that's why as you said it is yani, uh, in different levels you should know your level and do not exceed it and that's why Imam Malik who was the Imam of Darul Hijra in Medina major scholar he said and this what i'm going to say about imam malik two different stories in in one go but it answers the two questions you made he said i did not start giving fatawa until 70 of the scholars of medina seven zero of the scholars of medina look at that that time that time, the time, the very early time of Islam, uh, witnessed me that I'm qualified. And when they say that, it means that they uh, are the ones who told him to give fatawa, right? But Imam Malik himself who said that, and he was the Imam of Medina at that time, was approached by uh, pilgrims came from Iraq. And they said to him, Ya Imam, we came with 40 questions for the people of Iraq. They want the answers from you. He said, okay, uh, uh, read them. When the man finished 40, uh, the 40 had uh, questions, Imam Malik answered only four. The man said, yeah, Imam, what should I say to the people? He said, simple, go and tell them Imam Malik doesn't know the answer. That easy. But how could the person say that and do that? When you first of all learn it and you are approved by the shiuch, that means you are Abun Taqwa. Abun Taqwa. Otherwise, the shaitan will come and make you say, Abun Allah, that which you don't know. Or maybe you know that it is not like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So everyone can give da'wah. Yeah. But based on your level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Based on your level. Like, for example, it's not correct to say, Oh, wallah, I, I learned Usul uh, Talata. Grab my book, go uh, Africa, go India, go America teaching this book. That's wrong. That's wrong. No problem, teach it to your family, to your friends, yani with, with the benefits that you talk. 
And this is another thing, يعني, a couple of days ago, a brother from the West asked me, uh, saying that he studied Usul uh, Talat and Kitab Tawheed, and now he wants to teach it to his friends. Uh, and he makes them uh, listen to the recordings. I said, what recordings? I said, recordings of Sheikh Uthaymeen, because I learned it from there. I said, you learned it from recordings. He said, yes. I said, okay. Who authenticated your understanding now? As you listened to the, you did not study. You listened to the uh, recording. I have no problem. People listen. But do not consider yourself studied it until you are examined and approved that you understood the, 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 the lesson or the book. Then no problem to teach it. Before that, la, that's the dangerous. Because mm -hmm. if you say something uh, not, not correct, then you are going to earn the sins of all those people who follow you until the day of resurrection. SubhanAllah. Yeah, Allah wa'ala. Jazakallah khair. Ameen. Inshallah, yeah. uh, one more question. And it's still on the, on the topic of the da'wah. Um, some people, perhaps, um, who may not have learned a lot, <clears throat> or they're still learning. How much of an impact, especially living in, in the West, does your character and akhlaq carry when you're giving da'wah? First of all, uh, Islam is the, is the religion of akhlaq, of character. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِيُتَمِّمَا مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ And in other more authentic hadith, صَالِحَ الْأَخْلَاقِ He ﷺ said that I was sent to complete the perfect uh, and the good manners, meaning which people were upon, but with shortening, so I completed it. And when Aisha radiallahu anha was asked, after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa passed away, uh, what was, how was the manners of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? She said, his manners was the Quran. Don't you read the Quran? You see? So the Muslim who reads the Quran needs to be upon good manners. And when you are a da'i, you need to be upon much more uh, good manners and characters than other Muslims, you know. And subhanallah, uh, yani, uh, back to the question before it and this question, um, if I am not uh, knowledgeable, how can I participate in da'wah, in the field of da'wah? I will give two examples. And I leave the, uh, the decision for you. The first example is a brother in uh, Uganda. I met him there called Mustafa. He's a revert. And this, this brother, uh, when he accepted Islam, he, didn't, he wanted to serve Islam, but he didn't know what to do. What he did is he looked where the Muslims need some assist. And he found that they don't have, for example, uh, kind of hospitals or medical services for Muslims. And uh, they don't have enough masajid. And they don't have a kind of da'wah centers to the others, to the non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. And he started collecting money from everywhere and he established this and see how many now people come to Islam and come to know the true Islam through him. He's not a die until today, he's not a die. Another one, a brother here in, in, in the UK, uh, he is a river too. And he came to see that one day, he, he found that the deaf uh, people do not have any services here. So he started doing something. Until today, he's not claiming that he's a da'i, but he is doing the da'wah to the uh, deaf people. He established an organization, and now he's establishing a kind of uh, center as the first ever in, in the whole West, maybe, uh, that is for uh, special needs, people with special needs, and mainly for the deaf, with the facilities that qualify them to, and he brings the shiuch to uh, them and like that. So these examples of the 
true Muslim who wants to uh, earn hasanat like any da'i. Naam. Wallahu a'ala. Jazakallah khair. Allah yabarak. Barak Allah fiq. Allah It's been an absolute pleasure. Allah yabarak. Absolute honor to have you. Allah yabarak. Thank you. Inshallah we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get you to come another time. Inshallah. Inshallah. And we can have Inshallah. more discussions with you. More gems being told to us. You know. Alhamdulillah. Rabbi. Always a pleasure when you come. Always a blessing when you come. We we'll ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from you. And to preserve you. By the you. way I was in, in Burkina Faso one day. Yeah. And one of the graduates. He's a big sheikh. He's a doctor from Medina. But he's from Burkina. Uh-huh. He had a he had a daily program in the TV, the government TV, and he said, "I want you to go with me," and we did the interview. He said, uh, "Tell us about the experience of Dawah in the West." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Inshallah, it was a good discussion with him. Yeah, it was. It was. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Allah hafizak. Bye bye. Kfiyukum. Hafizkum. Zakum Allah khair. And may Allah Ta'ala put this in the scales of uh, your hasanat and all the brothers who uh, had this event to happen and exist. And may Allah Ta'ala make us to uh, meet and gather again and again in the field of da'wah and as Muslim brothers to uh, yani, uh, welcome each other. Jazakumullah khair. And you are all welcome when you come to Medina. Jazakumullah khair. Barakallah fiqh. Uh, inshallah, we'll leave it there. This has been uh, Beyond the Minbar, a very special episode. Alhamdulillah, I hope everyone has benefited. Uh, remember to like, subscribe, and comment, inshallah, about how you found the actual podcast and everything that you benefited from. And uh, we'll leave it there. I've been Muhammad Basaid with Sheikh Muhammad Maliki. Subhanakallah, Muhammadik. Shadu la ilaha 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 ilaha